breaking news. Here's something else to fear. Wake up my phone or turn on my TV, my constant assault of anxiety. Is it safe to go to school? Can I pay my bills? The planet is dying. Can you pass me my pills? We march in the streets. What is it this time? What new rage am I letting crawl into my mind? What new way has power made justice malign? Can someone please tell me we're gonna be fine? I stop and I breathe. I remind myself, things have always been this way. And what God once spoke to Isaiah, fear not, I'm here, don't be dismayed. I can still love, I can have faith, and not let this clickbait drown me in hate. Maybe what the world has really been missing is someone like me to stand up and be different. If you want to change the world, learn to stand confidently, whatever you face, no matter how fear-filled life becomes, whatever life throws at you, stand confidently. Our God is a God who brings transformation. We worship a transformational, world-changing God who wants those who've come to the cross and received Jesus, and by God's grace, I think about 13 or 14 people last week at Shoreline made that first-time commitment. Some of you are hearing your first sermon as a new believer in Jesus Christ, and that God who changed your life last week wants you to be part of his work to transform the world. That's the heart of God. That's our call. And so there's, there's so many different ways we can share in this work of God. And this, this little book, 2 Timothy, this letter from the Apostle Paul near the end of his life, writing to Timothy, this young pastor in this tough city called Ephesus in a tough time in history, is a call for the followers of Jesus to enter into God's world-changing work, to partner with the God who loves us. And so, so we've learned through these past weeks that if we want to be world changers, we, we become unflinchingly loyal. We stand strong and stay loyal even when the world kind of gives up on things. We, we become relentlessly truthful. We speak the truth in love and in grace, but we speak the truth. We become willingly sacrificial. The world looks on and is amazed when people in this me-centered world say, I'll give, I'll help, I'll serve without being paid back, just willingly sacrificial because that's what Jesus did for us. Amen? Amen. I mean, so, so we learn to be willingly sacrificial and we learn to live confidently in a world that is just absolutely filled with things that can terrify people, that can scare people. We can become paralyzed by fear instead of released by the power of the living God. And Paul is saying to Timothy, and I believe with all my heart the Holy Spirit is saying to each one of us, if you want to be a world changer, you make one decision, take one action, and impact one person. And that will change some part of their world. And you do that again later in that same day, and the next day, and the next day, and you become a world changer because day by day, you're making decisions that honor God. You're taking actions that show the presence of Jesus and reveal the power of God, and lives are being changed. And not just the lives of other people, but your life is changed when you live this way for God. And so the Apostle Paul is speaking to Timothy, and he's being very clear to Timothy that we live in, in a world that is filled with fear. And I think what's true back then is true today. I mean, just spend five minutes kind of looking at different media outlets and, and say, well, what's happening in our world? They're not lining up with just, just kind of oodles of good news and feel-good stories. Where, where did the feel-good stories go? I don't know, but they're, they're not on the news anymore. It's, it, it's, it's just, you know, so, so all of a sudden we look at our world, and we see a world where anger and shouting is the norm. Where people are just, people yell more now, I think, than they ever have before. And I, I think in my lifetime, I remember times where people who didn't agree with each other would just talk to each other and say, you know, I disagree with you about that. They didn't feel the need to scream and, and, ha and have this kind, of, kind of this violent thing. And, and then also we live in a world where, where violence and loss of innocent lives just seems to be the norm. And we look and go, what's going on in our world? Where disease and death on a global scale is put right in front of us. Whenever there's some kind of disease, we, you know, we hear about all those things and it can create you know, our hearts to grow filled with fear. Where internet attacks and identity theft is kind of out there. So, you know, can I even use my credit card? Can I even, you know, can I even say my name? Because someone's going to... You know, and we, we become we get paralyzed with fear. Where financial instability and ever-increasing national debt can be a scary thing. And, and we see all these things. And what can happen is we can start to just to be 
filled with fear and driven by fear and paralyzed by fear. And some of you are like, why did I come to church today? You're just, you know, you're, you're, now you got me thinking about all these things. Well, you don't need me to tell you about these things. They're out there all the time. But sometimes we look at the world and we say, and we'll say things like, it's the worst it's ever been. The world's never been as bad as it is now. But if you know your history and you study any century in human history, and there, there's always plenty of bad and fear-filling things out there. And if you turn the clock back to 64 to 67 AD in the first century, when the apostle Paul is doing his ministry, when Paul is writing to Timothy from jail, there were plenty of things that would have caused your average Christian in Rome to potentially be paralyzed by fear if they weren't careful. To keep them from being confident in faith, but captured by fear. Here's some of the things that were going on when Paul's writing these words to Timothy. All right? This is around the time that Rome burned, literally. Rome burned, and they blamed the Christians. It was Christians who set Rome on fire. This is a time in history when Nero, the emperor, launched a reign of terror, widespread terror, and persecution against all kinds of people, but particularly Christians. If you were a Christian, any time, day or night, there could be a pounding on your door and your family could be taken off. No, no trial, no explanation. That's what the world was like in the first century for Christians. They even had a sport arena called a Colosseum where they would often take Christians and throw them in as sport for the masses to watch the martyrdom and the killing of Christians. That's going on in the first century. When I understand the history of it, I can look at the fearful things today, and I go, oh, these are real, and they're big, but it's always been bad. And Christians have always had to decide, will I stand confidently in the power and the presence of Jesus, or will I tremble and be paralyzed with fear? And for each one of you, you have to make that decision. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have the choice to not be captured by fear, because in Jesus Christ's name and power, we don't have to live that way, and that's what Paul is saying to Timothy. He's saying, Timothy, even though it's really, really bad, you can still stand for Jesus. And so what we're going to look at today is this, is this letter going from the Apostle Paul to Timothy. And, and for the Apostle Paul, he's writing this letter from jail. Now, understand this. It's not the first time that Paul's been in jail. But it's probably the last time. Because he knows he's near the end of his life. It's not the first time the Apostle Paul is writing a letter, but it's probably his last letter. And he knows that. And Paul's writing to this young pastor, Timothy. And, and he's calling Timothy to a confident faith to stand strong whatever he faces because he knows that that's what's gonna give him power to be a world changer, to make an impact. So Paul is a faithful follower of Jesus, but he's a prisoner of Rome when he writes this letter. And he's confidently facing death and he's ready to receive the promises of God. He's looking and he sees heaven on the horizon. And he knows he's run the race. And so, so, so Paul now is looking and saying to Timothy, you need to hold strong in your faith no matter what you face. So listen to what the Apostle Paul writes in 2 Timothy 4, beginning in verse 6. And I, I want you to notice the confidence and the strength of the Apostle Paul. He's in jail again. He's been beaten five times with a scourge. He's been beaten with a rod three times. He's been stoned one time. He's been through it. And here he is drawing near the end, and this is what he writes to Timothy. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time of my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I love that. And now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. He's looking ahead to heaven. And not only me, but also all those who have longed for his appearing, all those who wait for the appearing of Jesus. L listen to the Apostle Paul. Does he sound fearful? Does he sound timid? He's still gentle-spirited, but he is confident. I, I, I have fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. And now there's a crown of righteousness waiting for me. Here's the Apostle Paul. Here he stands near the end of his life. And he looks back at all that came before. And he says, through all I've gone through, God has been faithful. And God is good. And then he looks ahead to heaven. 
And he says, God is faithful and God is good. He has the crown waiting for me. And he looks right where he's standing, right there in jail. And in jail, incarcerated for doing the right thing, for preaching Jesus, Paul says, right now, right where I am, God is good, God is faithful. That's not letting fear take over your life. That's standing confident in Jesus Christ. When you look back, when you look ahead, and when you look right where you are right now, that's the heart of the Apostle Paul. And, and, then, and then we look at, at Timothy. And, and Paul is saying to Timothy, listen, you need to walk in confidence. Paul's saying to Timothy, I'm about to go, but you're staying. And things aren't getting any better, but we need people like you, Timothy, to stand for Jesus. And, and, and this word confidence from the Latin word, and a lot of Latin words are emerging of two different words. It's from two words, con and fetus, which basically mean with and faith. Confidence is con, with, faith. What does it mean to be confident? Here's what it means. I stand with faith. I stand in Jesus Christ. I stand with faith. I stand in faith. I stand in the power of Jesus. That's confidence. Because here's the challenge. If I put my confidence in my savings and the stock market... My confidence is going to go, woo, woo, right? I mean, that, if that's my confidence, and then it rides every week and month with whatever's happening. If my confidence is in the people around me, I'm still going to be on a roller coaster because people are, if I put my confidence in anything or anyone but Jesus, I'm on a roller coaster. But when I am with faith, putting my confidence in Jesus Christ, I can stand strong and look back ahead and now and say, the God that I follow, the God who saved me through Jesus Christ, is good and faithful, and he's with me. That's what Paul is calling Timothy to do, how he's calling him to live. And so we meet Timothy. He's a receiver of the highest charge in the most challenging of times. He's called to bring the message of Jesus in a time where, the, where the people are being persecuted for doing exactly that. He's confidently commissioned and equipped for the work of God. That's Timothy. He's got this charge in challenging times. He's commissioned for the work of God. That's what he's called to do. And he's in an environment in, in the city of Ephesus where there is pagan immorality, there is sexual immorality, there's all kinds of impropriety. It's all around him. Christians are being persecuted and it's encouraged and cheered on. And Paul says to Timothy, Paul says, Timothy, stand strong. Don't give up. Hang in there. Man, that's quite a call. Look at verses one and two of 2 Timothy chapter four. Paul says to Timothy, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. So hear this for Timothy first, but let God speak to your heart as well. He says, Timothy, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season all the time. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. There's tenderness, there's clarity of thought, great patience, careful instruction. But Paul says, preach the word. You know what Paul's saying to Timothy? And Timothy knows it. Here's what Paul's saying to Timothy. Timothy, I want you to do exactly what put me in jail. Paul says, Timothy, you know I'm in jail for preaching Jesus again. You know, I've been strapped up and beaten five times for preaching Jesus. You know, three times I was beat with rods. You know what I've been through, Timothy. And Timothy, I want you to do exactly what put me here. Need a little confidence for that? Right? But that's what Paul's calling Timothy to. And I believe that's what God calls us who know Jesus Christ to do and be. And at Shoreline, every time we gather... There's many people who know Jesus, who've come to the cross and received Jesus, and we always have many people who are sort of trying to figure out the whole Jesus thing. You're curious, you're searching, you're seeking, you're not, and Shoreline is a great church to be just to kind of listen, no pressure for you, but you can learn more and more about Jesus and who he is and what he's done. But if you know Jesus and the Holy Spirit lives in you, God says to you and me, he says, stand confident with faith in a world that oftentimes is gonna push against that faith. In a world that can oftentimes be filled with fear. And can I tell you something about standing with faith? Standing in tough times? We won't be ready to stand in the really hard times if we can't stand in the kind of hard times. 
And there's places in the world where Christians are experiencing martyrdom and abuse and beating. More in history, there's more Christians killed for their faith in history right now than any time in human history. It's just the media doesn't cover that. But around the world, Christians are losing their life for their faith and they're standing strong. If we can't stand strong with the inconveniences and the struggles we face, how will we stand strong in the really hard times? And you know when we most need faith in Jesus and the community of God's people? In the hard times. I've been a pastor for over 30 years now. And I've watched people when they're struggling and hurting and, and, and they, there's a, you know, a scary diagnosis or a different thing that happens, difficult thing that happens with a child or something in their life they weren't expecting or a financial downturn. And they say, okay, God, I, 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 can't, I, I can't be near you. I don't want anything to do with you because I went through this hard time. And the very time they need the power of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, they're pushing God away. Not that you can push God away, but we can try. We can run. So in the good times and in the hard times, stand with confidence in the power, in the presence of Jesus Christ. And so Paul calls Timothy to stand with that kind of confidence. And then Paul gives Timothy uh, three different kind of insights about kind of the new normal, what life is going to be like for him. And I think it's kind of like what life is like for us. These are things that are kind of timeless realities that we're going to face as we're seeking to stand confidently for Jesus. So, so Paul shares with Timothy kind of the new normal for Timothy. It's kind of our new normal, the world we live in. Here's the first thing Paul shares. Beware of compromising of biblical truths for cultural appeal. Paul says, Timothy, be careful. Don't be afraid of all the pressures of culture because there's a temptation to compromise on the word of God, on biblical truth, because culture is moving a certain way, the flow of culture is pushing a certain way, and you feel that pressure at school or at work or through the media or through family and friends or maybe even in your own heart, but you feel that pressure. And it's like, well, do I give up on what God says because of cultural pressures. So here's what Paul says in verse three to Timothy, and we get to listen over his shoulder and listen for ourselves. Paul says, Timothy, the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine, sound Bible teaching. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers, listen to this picture, to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Paul says, Timothy, be ready. There's gonna be people who are gonna say, hey, tell us what makes us happy. Tell us what makes us feel good. Don't, don't challenge us. Don't, you know, don't, point, don't point out things in us that are wrong or a problem, but, but tell us what makes us feel good. And you know what? As a pastor, I occasionally get letters from people that don't like what I preach. It doesn't bother me. It's gonna bother me if I never get any letters. Now, I'm not telling you to send me a letter, uh, but, my, but, but, my, but, but, the point, but the point is this. The point is this. If we preach the word of God as culture ebbs and flows and goes this way and that culture changes continually, God stays the same yesterday, today, and forever. So are we gonna get pushback? Yes. Will pastors get pushback? Yes. Will you get pushback if you stand confidently on God's word? Yes, you will. But Paul says, Timothy, understand don't compromise in those times. Stand strong in those times. And, and, and don't, don't let culture define what you believe. Let God's word and true doctrine define what you believe and who you are. And when you do that, you will stand confident. Not controlled by fear, what people think of me, but confidence in what God sees in you. Amen? That's God's desire for us. And then Paul says to Timothy a second thing. He says, Timothy, the new normal for, for the world then, and it's still our new normal today, and it'll be the normal thing until Jesus returns, is the allure of worldly pursuits, pleasures, and ideologies. There's always gonna be those worldly things that, that catch our attention and that entice us. And we end up saying, well, I really want that. And what ends up happening is we pursue that and want that more than we want God. And we run off the track off the trail of what we should be pursuing. So Paul says in verse 10 to Timothy, he says, do your best to come to me quickly for Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Now who's Demas? One of Paul's closest colleagues and partners in the ministry. He had traveled with Paul and Timothy. And Paul says, Demas has gotten so enamored with the world, he's just kind of wandered off. He's no longer pursuing Jesus. Have you ever watched that happen in the life of someone you love? 
Have you ever watched it happen to the person that you see in the mirror every day when you look in the mirror? There are enticements and lures of things in this world that will say, seek me, love me, follow me, consume me, whatever it is, and it can take over our lives. And Paul says to Timothy, be careful. If you want to stand confident in your faith, know those things that are coming your way. Identify them, be ready for them, and stand against them. That's been the case in the world from the beginning. It always will be. But will we pursue Jesus even in those times? And then the third thing Paul says to Timothy is this. He says the new normal, your normal, our normal, growing opposition to the Christian faith. Paul says, Timothy, you know it's bad, but that challenge is not going away. As a matter of fact, Paul had a personal encounter that he shares right here. Paul says in verse 14, he says to Timothy, Alexander, the metal worker, did me a great deal of harm. We don't even know what that means. Paul just says, this guy named Alexander, the metal worker, did me a great deal of harm. Physical harm, relational harm, reputational harm, we don't know. But then he says, the Lord will repay him for what he has done. You too should be on your guard against him because he strongly opposed our message. This guy, Alexander, is opposing the message of Jesus, and so he attacked Paul in some way, and it hurt, man. It cost something for Paul. And, and you know, Paul says two things about this attack that happened on him. Number one, it's interesting. He says, I'll let God take care of him. I'm not gonna retaliate. He says, God, I, God you deal with this guy. But he, but he also says to Timothy, but you too should be on your guard against him. So, so this, this sense of forgiveness and not retaliating, but also readiness and wisdom. Paul says, you know, I took my hits from this guy. God will deal with him. But Timothy, be careful. Watch out for this guy. There's something about wisdom, right? Being shrewd and being wise. We don't have to be beat up. If, if it comes our way, we'll stand for Jesus. But be wise. And then don't be the one who has to retaliate. Say, God, I leave that in your hands. And God is the one who's the ultimate judge. Man, that's challenging. That will stretch your faith as you stand confident in Jesus Christ. And then, then Paul walks through these four uh, world-changing lessons. Paul says, Timothy, here's some ways that you can live a world-changing life. And we can listen right now and say, God, speak to our hearts. Speak into our lives and show us how we can make an impact on the world around us. So if you're, if you're a note taker, you've seen your bulletin or on your shoreline app, there's a place to write some of these things down. So it's the call and the vision of God is to live with confidence, live confidently. Here's lesson number one. Stay focused on him and his call for your life. Keep your focus on God. Keep your eyes on Jesus, his plan for your life, where he's leading you, where he's taking you. So Paul says this in chapter four, verse five of 2 Timothy. He says, but you keep your head in all situations, Endure hardships, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. Paul says to Timothy, but you, and that but you in the Greek, it's two little words, su de. And what it means, but as for you, you're different than others. You live differently. I think that's for everyone who's a Christian. But as for you, when tough times come, right? Keep your head in all situations, man. Keep focused. Keep your head on straight. Know where you're going. Endure hardships. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. Paul says, Timothy, do what God's called you to do. Stay focused. Don't be the guy who's, who's constantly, you know, squirrel, squirrel. You know, what, what's distraction, distraction? Oh, I can, I can do this. He says, he says, Timothy, stay focused. Stay focused. And you know where we focus? We focus on Jesus the pioneer, the author, and the perfecter of our faith who for the joy set before him took the cross for us. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. If you wanna be a world changer who stands confidently, man, when the tough times come, just turn your eyes to Jesus. Turn your heart to Jesus. You know how you learn to keep your eyes on Jesus in the hard times? Keep your eyes on Jesus every day. This is why at Shoreline we challenge you Week after week after week, you know, spend time, open this book every day. We have a daily reading guide in the, in the bulletin on our website, on the app, where you can have, you know, scriptures for each day of the week, some prayer direction, some life reflection. We give you things. I would challenge you, start your mornings and open this book, whether it's, you know, five minutes or 10 minutes or 30 minutes, but take some time and open this book and talk to Jesus and say, Jesus, today, keep my eyes fixed on you, whatever comes my way. 
Whatever distractions come, let me keep fixed on you. And here's the thing. God is Lord of all things. He's not against the different things that are happening in our lives, but he wants our focus on him as we walk through all of life, not our focus all over the place and occasionally on him. So, so live your life and have wonderful, great experiences, but in whatever you do, man, keep your eyes on Jesus in all that you walk through, in all that you do. Here's a question for you. Are there things in your life that are distracting or discouraging you from fully pursuing God's call in your life? Are there things right now, and, and you know what they are, that, man, it's just constantly pulling your attention here, and it's not things that where Christ is in the middle of it. It's just the stuff of life. And how do you say, I want more and more for my attention in all of life to be on Jesus Christ? How do you make that shift of your mind and your heart and your eyes? Well, Paul gives Timothy and all of us a second lesson. To praise his name and proclaim his good news. Whatever you experience, you want to be a confident Christian in a world filled with fear, you just keep praising God and proclaiming how good he is. Let the world know that you know him, that you see him, and let God know you're thankful. So look at verse 17 of chapter 4 of 2 Timothy. Paul says, and this is powerful stuff. He says, but the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength so that through me the message might fully be proclaimed to all the Gentiles, all the Gentiles might hear it, all those that weren't yet, that weren't Jewish, it was kind of the rest of the world. And Paul says, and I was delivered from the lion's mouth. Now listen to verse 18. He says, the Lord will rescue me from every evil attack. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack. This is the guy who five times was strapped up and got the 40 lashes less one. And, and, and he says, and, and, and the Lord will rescue me from every evil attack. This is the guy who three times was beaten with rods, but God will deliver me, rescue me from every evil attack. This is the guy who was stoned and left for dead in the city junkyard. How can he say the Lord will rescue me from every evil attack? How can he say that? And here, I believe this is what Paul is saying because he doesn't believe that being rescued and delivered by God means that he won't face hard things. He believes being rescued and delivered means that he will never be left alone as he goes through the hard things and God will bring him through. And Paul says, Timothy, God's delivered me and rescued me from everything and he'll rescue you too. But he's not saying, Timothy, so you'll never have hard times. He's saying you'll never go through a hard time alone if you keep your focus on Jesus. And you won't. So there's this understanding. Praise him. Proclaim his good news no matter what you go through. And he says, then he will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul can declare, to him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Even though he's in jail right now when he's writing this. And he's gone through all these things. And, and, and Paul, in many ways, when he looked at his imprisonment, didn't even see his imprisonment as a bad thing. In the book of Philippians, you know what he says? Well, it's kind of nice that I'm in jail here because all the prison guards get to hear about Jesus. Read Philippians chapter one. And back then, they would chain a Roman guard to the person so that a Roman guard couldn't get away. Paul's going, man, I got an audience all the time. <laughs> you think I'm chained to you? You're chained to me. This, this, wherever God put him, Paul said, here I am. I will serve Jesus. That's confidence and faith. That's not letting the fear of the world take over. So here's the question. Is there someone in your life who needs to hear the message of hope that is found in Jesus alone? Who has God handcuffed to you? Who has God put around you? They did it in a cubicle next to you. They can't get away. They're your next door neighbor. Not that you go and attack them with the gospel. That's not the point. But naturally, lovingly, you show your love for Jesus, the power of God in your life, your eyes fixed on him. And when you, you want to be a witness to the world. When you go through the fire, you go through it with Jesus. When you go through the deep waters, you go through them with Jesus. Because a lot of people in the world think we're just playing a game coming to church here, and we know we've met the living God. We know this. And we belong to him and we are loved by him. And he is our stronghold and our mighty tower and our fortress and our ever-present hope in times of need. That's our God. And when the world sees that's real, they may not believe doctrine of the Bible, but when they see your life is real and you stand on the rock, on Christ the solid rock I stand, the great hymn says, all other ground is sinking sand. On Christ the solid rock I stand. When you stand on Jesus confidently, with faith, 
the world looks and says, I need some of that. And you got something to talk about. You have something to share with the world. Lesson number three. Paul says to Timothy, and then the Spirit says to us, find encouragement and support in his community. Be part of the community of faith. Be, in the good times and the tough times, stay connected to God's people, to the church. Verse 21 says, do your best to get here before winter. Euboas greets you, and so do Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brothers and sisters. Paul's always talking about the church. He's always talking about God's people. And he says, in the midst of all this, he says, listen, God's people, they greet you. You And I want you to come and connect, relationship, fellowship. You want to stand strong and confident in your faith. Listen closely. Don't stand alone. Be among God's people. Jump into into a Bible study. I talked to two uh, college students, two young women, sitting right here in the second row. They happen to sit right behind me, which means I got a chance to talk to them. And these two young women, I said, listen, we got a bunch of 20-something young women in our church in some different Bible studies. And they're like, really? And I sent them with the person who invited them. A woman in the church invited one to come to church. And then she invited, if she didn't want to come home, she brought a friend. And so here's somebody who was invited. And that person invited another person. And they were so touched by being here among God's people. They're gonna, and I, I said, if you're sitting right there next week, right now my wife Sherry is with, with the Stroud family. But, but I said, my wife will be sitting right here next to me next week. And if you come sit right behind us, I want you to meet my wife. They said, we'll be back. We need the fellowship of God's people. Whether we're young college students or in our 70s, 80s, or 90s, it doesn't matter. So be part of the body. And when you come to night of worship this Wednesday, stick around. Afterwards, we have refreshments in the worship center, snacks in church, yes. After the service is done, we we uncover these tables with snacks, and we hang out for like 10 or 15 minutes and just talk together and get to know people, have fellowship. If you normally walk out of here 10 seconds after I give you the word of blessing, stay for two minutes. Just linger, meet someone, hang out, go in the courtyard, talk with somebody. Be the body of Christ. There's strength. We become confident in faith when we stand together with God's people. Here's the question. Are you consistently engaging in Christian community to help strengthen and sharpen your faith? Because being in community, man, getting into a Bible study, coming to a Wednesday night class, uh, being being in in a community group, you connect with people and that strengthens your faith. And then finally, how can we live confidently in these fearful times? Lesson number four. Live in his presence covered by his grace. You want to stand confidently? Man, know that you stand in the grace of Jesus and extend that grace to others. Some people define grace, this G-R-A-C-E, as God's riches at Christ's expense. And we've been lavished with God's grace and goodness. Share that with others. Pour it out on others. And in verse 22, Paul says these words, writes these words to Timothy. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you all. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you all. Man, receive the grace of Jesus. Stand in the grace of Jesus. Share the grace of Jesus and you will grow stronger and stronger in faith. And so I want to give you a word of blessing. I want to ask you if you're physically able, if you can't physically, that's fine. If you're physically able, would you stand with me? And I want to give you a word of blessing before we send you out of here. As you're standing, I want to invite you If you want prayer after the service, come forward for prayer. We'll have teams up here. And if you've got a real challenge or somebody you love has a real challenge, over on this side, the team is ready to lay hands, anoint with oil if you request that, and pray for God's power in your life. If you have questions about Shoreline Church, the Connection Center, they have answers to everything. I don't have answers to everything. They do. And and if you're new, go by there. They also want to give you a gift, and thank you for coming. But as I send you out of here, I want you to look up on the center screen there. You're going to see the four things we've talked about this last month. You want to be a world changer? Be unflinchingly loyal, relentlessly truthful, willingly sacrificial, confidently living in faith, with faith in Jesus Christ. And if you do that, the world will take notice. And God will use you to be a blessing to others. As you go from this place, we walk in a fear-filled world. Don't feed on the fear And don't let the fear guide your life. If you are a follower of Jesus, stand confident with faith in Jesus Christ. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Keep growing in your faith. And live in such a way that people say, man, that's real. She knows Jesus. He knows Jesus. And when they ask you, tell them about the one you know. Oh God, send us from here 
in your strength and in your power. We, we pray together, not filled with fear, but with confidence. We pray for the Stroud family. We pray for Jake, wherever he is right now. We pray for Sean and Amy and the family as they're, as they're waiting and looking and searching. We pray for Kari and the kids. Surround them with your grace, Lord. We stand in confidence on their behalf, the body of Christ. Send us from here, confidently living for and with Jesus in all things, in all places, for his glory. And everyone said? Amen. God bless you. We'll see you Wednesday night at Night of Worship.